And within this hybrid group I've defined, uh, I'm considering these individuals who perhaps do a little bit of all of the above. So practice psychology, um, do those evaluations or, or treat individuals who are legally involved, perhaps are also involved in research or consultation um, related to policy or other community legal uh, activities. So psychology itself is an exceedingly broad field. And this slide is essentially intended to kind of illustrate the various specialties and subspecialties that exist within it, and then more carefully, more specifically delineate uh, the relationship of the fields or subfields that overlap most with forensics. Um, so areas that are related to the practice specifically of forensic psychology uh, include most often uh, clinical or abnormal psychology, counseling psychology, or, or school psychology. And these areas or programs, such as educational programs within these disciplines, provide clinical experience uh, with patients that are necessary to become licensed to practice psychology. And they also provide the necessary experience and skills um, to allow an individual to engage in forensic evaluation or treatment of forensic populations. Um, and I would say that this is not a perfect fit by any means. Uh, psychiatry likely best sort of is nested in this, this model um, near these areas. Um, it's a medical discipline you know, related to treating abnormal mental health problems. And uh, further, associated training, and we'll get to this later, but the trajectory that leads one to become a psychiatrist um, and obtain a license to practice medicine uh, is, is most closely associated with the trajectories within psychology, such as clinical psychology, counseling psychology, school psychology, that allows one to become licensed to practice psychology. Um, a quick distinction for, though I'm sure most are aware of this, uh, in terms of treatment itself, you know, psychiatrists are able in the practice of medicine to prescribe medication, um, where psychologists in most jurisdictions are, are not able to do that. Um, you know, however, there are myriad other areas within psychology that significantly contribute to forensic or legally associated research. And I'll speak to this more specifically later, but those include you know, experimental cognitive psychology, social psychology, developmental psychology, community psychology. All right. So to specifically speak a little bit more to what the, the job or role of a practitioner um, who's a forensic psychologist or psychology, psychiatrist looks like, um, I'll, I'll, I'll outline some of the different types of, of jobs or job tasks that these individuals are involved in. Um, primarily, this involves evaluations and testimony in a variety of types of legal cases um, and potentially court-ordered treatment, though some people consider this to be correctional psychology versus forensic psychology or psychiatry. Uh, the location in which a forensic psychologist or psychiatrist may practice really can tremendously vary. Uh, it maybe in a jail or a prison, in a state hospital, uh, in a court or court-ordered clinic, uh, or in a community for individuals specifically who, who have private practices. Um, I'll add this, that the, the picture I have noted to, or have uh, here, uh, is specifically because not only might one find themselves doing an evaluation in the context of a jail or prison, um, but depending on the individual who they're evaluating, they may also find themselves on specifically the floor of a shoe, the security housing unit, uh, doing an evaluation through the slot. I did an evaluation in such a context last week and thought I should share that um, with the sidebar that not being too worried about getting dirty in doing evaluations is something to consider in becoming a forensic psychologist, potentially, specifically in the criminal arena. 
Um, populations that individuals who are forensic psychologists and psychiatrists uh, evaluate or treat are also extremely diverse. Um, these may be individuals in the, who are involved in the criminal system or juvenile justice system, uh, such as these gentlemen who you may recognize, um, high-profile cases of uh, Dahmer and Jared Lochner, uh, as well as sex offenders, um, plaintiffs or you know, individuals who are not involved in the criminal arena, but in civil cases. Um, in the context of evaluation, such as guardianship or conservatorships, psychologists or psychiatrists may evaluate a specifically geriatric population. Um, I'm actually also trained as a child and adolescent psychologist, and accordingly do work with children both in the civil arena in child custody evaluations, as well as uh, kids that are involved in the justice system. Um, kids, though this is somewhat of an overlap, as that is actually a picture of Mr. Dahmer as a child, um, as well as persons with you know, traumatic brain injuries or who have neurological damage. I know Dr. Martel um, is specially certified in, as a neuropsychologist and uh, likely does evaluations with this type of population. Uh, that's true. Ah, good. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a brain just, just for you, Dr. Martel. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, so here are just a few examples of the myriad types of civil or criminal evaluations that individuals might do in, in this field. Um, I believe this might involve you know, child custody, where one may conduct evaluations with children or children as, as well as their parents to determine uh, the, the ability of individuals' parenting skills and, and make recommendations to the court relative to issues of, of, of custody, um, workers' compensation or personal liability, guardianship or conservatorship, which has to do with uh, an individual's ability to care for themselves and their health and or financial um, needs. I've done a, a few of these in the civil context with the geriatric population specifically. Um, there are other psychologists and psychiatrists who specialize in areas such as fitness for duty. And those are evaluations that are done um, with police, for example, to determine if individuals are able to, to function and operate as police officers. Um, in the criminal arena, the I guess I would possibly say bread and butter of criminal evaluation seem to be competence to stand trial and not guilty by reason of insanity evals. I can say in my role as a state evaluator uh, in Georgia, I do a few of these a week. Um, also juvenile evaluations, which may involve similar issues um, or more broadly just looking, depending on the court and various other factors, uh, just the psychological kind of state of of the youth who is justice involved uh, and possibly treatment recommendations. Additionally, risk assessments. Um, I've written here for sexual offenders, but risk assessments can actually encompass looking at risk of violence for individuals relative to whether they're, you know, if somebody was found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed to an inpatient hospital, uh, one might do a risk assessment to determine if they are uh, able to function in a less restrictive environment than the hospital setting and present results to, uh, to a court in, to, to aid them in making that type of decision. Dr. Martell, are there any other types of evaluations that you commonly do that I'm, I may be leaving out here? Uh, no, I think you've done a nice job of uh, covering the waterfront. Okay. Um, you know, there there are you know specific uh, areas. I'm typing answers to questions here, so I'm, oh. I'm 
part of my, sorry. I'm a little bit distracted. Um, oh, no, not at all. I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to just uh, loop you in there out of nowhere. Can, can, uh, can it's no problem. With your, um, when the questions but, are, are fewer. Sorry, go ahead. But, but yes, there can be specific issues, for example, in, in death penalty cases, when the jury is being asked to decide whether to give someone life in prison or the death penalty, uh, testimony from mental health professionals can be very important in helping them understand who the person is and helping to inform their decision uh, about what kind of penalty the person should get. Uh, so that's that's another area within the criminal side, um, yeah. where where mental health professionals often are uh, very important witnesses. Absolutely, and and it reminded me of you know depending I guess on on who um, is employing you and, and multiple different factors. Uh, there may be also more nuanced questions that individuals are asked. For example, recently. Um, in being hired by a defense attorney on a case, uh, based on my experience with juveniles, uh, I was this person was interested in helping in, in my providing an evaluation to help a jury understand factors related to youthfulness and child development uh, and the type of you know and, and how that would have impacted uh, this particular youth in committing the, the crime he allegedly committed. So um, there really is a, a tremendous amount of variety that one uh, is able to engage in and, and address within this field, um, which makes it exciting, I think. Um, all right, so other practitioner roles, there are, there are, there are so many, um, you know, may include consulting and in criminal investigations, consulting with government agencies, uh, of various types, um, conducting threat assessments. Uh, I know um, a colleague of Dr. Martel has uh, is a particular, particularly an expert in in this arena. Um, uh, assist in psychological autopsies, though this is less common. I can add that uh, in my fellowship, which is at um, University of Southern California. The Institute of Psychiatry and Law, they had a close uh, relationship with the Los Angeles coroner's uh, office. And accordingly, I was able to participate in this type of activity, which involves retrospectively looking at factors that uh, could help explain the mode of, of death um, and helping the coroner to to answer those types of questions. For example, if the death was more likely a suicide or an accident. Um, of course, individuals in this field may also function as educators or, or be involved in, in, in research in various capacities. Um, however, there are people uh, who are also forensic psychologists or psychiatrists who are not involved in, in practice, um, meaning in evaluating legally involved individuals um, and primarily focus on research. And some of those individuals may be trained uh, as developmental or cognitive or social psychologists. Uh, they may be within the area of community psychology. Um, these individuals would not likely pursue getting a license um, to practice psychology and accordingly their activities may uh, be primarily in the areas of the research, consulting, or educating, um, or even policy making. Uh, work settings could, in, you know, primarily would involve likely academia um, within a medical school, psychology school, school of social work, um, or, or working in the context of research or policy institute, a government agency, um, or a nonprofit or advocacy setting, and. There are so many different areas that could be researched um, that relate to mental health or psychology and, and the law. This is essentially just a small sampling of how professionals in certain disciplines um, have applied their knowledge to legal issues. Uh, for example, 
persons in cognition or who specialize in personality psychology um, may conduct research related to jury decision making, uh, trial strategy, uh, or even the media impact on, on various trial tactics. I know that's a topic that came up often, actually overlaps with, with this image um, within the Trayvon Martin case. Uh, moreover, individuals focused in social or developmental psychology may be interested in the influence uh, on juvenile legal involvement, various influences uh, related to development or other social factors on, on juvenile involvement uh, or prevention methods, uh, as well as the impact of racial bias on various aspects of legal involvement, such as you know, arrest rates, et, et cetera. Um, individuals in the areas of cognitive psychology or memory, or may more specifically you know, be interested in memory as it impacts issues such as eyewitness identification or false confessions. I know there's a, a large uh, number of researchers and a, quite a good program in, of research in this area at Cornell University. Um, and moreover, persons who are specialized in clinical psychology uh, or in psychiatry or collaborate with individuals from various disciplines may be involved in research in developing assessment methods or evaluation methods um, that are specifically related to forensic evaluations. And for example, the issue of malingering or feigning symptoms of mental illness for, for secondary gain quite often arises in uh, forensic context and specific assessments um, to be studied in those populations uh, to validate those measures uh, is necessary. Moreover, individuals who are interested in uh, genetic underpinnings of behaviors that overlap with, well, certainly criminal law, such as violence, um, or neurological factors that may impact violence are areas of study um, that persons in these specific subdisciplines may be may pursue. Um, there are really endless possibilities, and it, it's quite a creative activity itself. Research can be. Um, so that's just a sampling. So in terms of educational pathways, um, <laughs> sort of a choose your own adventure uh, in, in figuring out how one wants to pursue the appropriate training to reach, uh, well, it's to, to pursue any of these specific areas that we've discussed today. And there are different, actually many <laughs> different trajectories. Um, the first trajectory that I'll discuss is the, the graduate school trajectory, which in this case, we'll first speak to how one uh, can become a forensic psychologist uh, specifically who is able to be licensed to do evaluations or treat individuals, right? So, of course, the undergraduate degree is requisite, and specialty areas or rather concentration or majors that one may choose um, I've, I've listed psychology or sociology here, but I've also listed anything you en enjoy. Because quite honestly, I, I think that truly exploring as, as much as you can in your undergraduate years and and not specializing too quickly um, is really worthwhile. And, and one may be surprised uh, in terms of how areas outside of a specific field, such as psychology, could even influence uh, their, or add to their ability to, to a certain specialty later. Um, so after undergrad, one would take the graduate uh, entrance exam, a GRE, uh, prior to applying to graduate school. And in terms of graduate school, there there are myriad <laughs> options that one uh, has that seem to be expanding by the day in specifically terms of getting one towards forensics uh, or forensic psychology. Um, here I've listed a PhD program to a traditional uh, doctor of philosophy in psychology uh, programs. 
and one would specialize here to receive a license in likely you know, clinical uh, or counseling or school psychology, uh, as as well as some of the newer programs that also offer uh, forensic psychology as a, a PhD uh, specialty. Um, there are also PsyD programs, which are Doctorate of Psychology. I believe these programs are more specifically professionally geared. So PhD programs generally, and I'm speaking generally here, uh, tend to have a strong research focus as well as a clinical focus, um, whereas a PsyD program generally does not have the same level of uh, research um, focus to it. There are also programs such as joint JD and PhD uh, it's programs that have, have developed over the, the last number of years um, that allow one to pursue even more specialized training in becoming both a lawyer and uh, receiving a, a doctorate specifically in psychology. Um, grad school can't avoid the orals or the dissertation. <laughs> Those are going to be part likely of all of these types of programs. Um, once completing graduate school, if one takes a route to become licensed, um, there is typically a year of internship. And there are various specialties that one may pursue within an internship. Uh, but generally, an internship is about getting really concentrated and focused uh, practice experience, or doing evaluations and providing treatment for various populations. And there are websites that I will show later that, uh, on, a, on a later slide, that elucidate different types of uh, internships that one may pursue, or how to research that further. After internship, one may then further specialize um, by pursuing a forensic postdoctoral uh, fellowship. And there are many different programs that uh, one can research uh, related to, to fellowship year. And it's usually during that year or after that year that uh, one then pursues a license. And so this is just another example of uh, the various trajectories that one may take uh, in pursuing grad graduate school towards the goal of receiving a license to become a licensed psychologist and then licensed forensic psychologist. Okay. Oh, I think the one piece that I do want to mention here is that there are various programs that offer both concurrent JD and PhDs um, or separate uh, JD and PhDs. Uh, so if one is interested in, in doing that joint uh, law and psychology uh, training, uh, researching the pros and cons of, of those different options, uh, it might be worthwhile. And I'll just briefly cover this. Um, the grad school pathway for an individual who wants to specifically focus on research but not, not go that licensure route that practicum or the route that the route that causes uh, leads one to to practice psychology or psychiatry um, one would also pursue an undergraduate degree and complete the GRE and, and go to graduate school but in one of those subdisciplines of psychology that I mentioned prior uh, with a primary focus on on research oral and dissertation uh, can't avoid it, regardless of what area you're in. And um, some of those research areas uh, would involve personality, like would be within the subdisciplines of personality psychology, social psychology, uh, et cetera. Okay, so educational resources uh, for graduate school. Uh, there's some really good ones out there, and these are really worth taking a look at. Um, AFS itself uh, has its student page that I would encourage all of you to look at that provides a nice overview of forensic psychology and the behavioral sciences and forensic psychiatry. Um, 
moreover, the American Psychology and Law Society uh, provides quite a comprehensive student section that also includes a guide to graduate programs in forensic psychology and a guide to internships and fellowships. Um, I understand that a number of individuals in our audience are likely in high school, um, some may be in college, so these may be um, a few steps ahead of where you are in, in thinking about uh, such specific level of specialization in your career. Um, but nonetheless, maybe fun, fun to look at and thinking about uh, in, in planning ahead. Um, and also the, the American Psychological Association offers a student page um, that I provided here. And I, I can make available um, during the question section when I'm involved um, and also via email with a list of these resources um, for, for anyone who's interested and, and send them to you. Um, oh, and for, for individuals who would perhaps go the clinical psychology route, which is actually the route that I took and Dr. Martel took as well, um, just the old U.S. News uh, and World Report uh, programs where they're listing the top programs in different areas is a useful resource in, just in terms of identifying what strong clinical or I think counseling programs are. Uh, within psychology. Okay. So. I, I'd jump in just for a second here on, on yes. that one. Can you hear me? Yes. I'd jump in just for a second to say I got a great piece of advice when I was considering a JD, PhD joint degree program. And the advice was pick one profession or the other and go to a school that has both a great psychology department or psychiatry department and a great law school and learn as much about both things as you can, but just be a master of one. And I, I think that was great advice, and it's advice that I took and advice that I pass along. That is a very good good point. It's interesting, but anecdotally, I was speaking with a, a friend and colleague who has a JD and a PhD who didn't do them concurrently, but decided after getting her law degree, she wanted to become a, a psychologist. And... Um, she actually echoed in, in some ways that, that piece of advice, so I thought I'd share that as well. Um, perhaps I'll also mention that, um, you know, while, I'm, and perhaps this is coming from a somewhat biased place since I attended a, a clinical psychology program, but um, while the program I attended for my graduate school, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, did not have a strong forensic focus, I must say that the, the rigor in the research training and the clinical training that I received, um, even though it was not specifically oriented to a forensic population, uh, has proved invaluable, I believe, in terms of the way I now apply those skills granted to a slightly different population I worked with then. Um, you know, than I did in graduate school, uh, but but truly provided just strong clinical training, and and there's something to be said um, for that uh, as well. Um, I don't know, Dan, if or Dr. Martell, if, if you had only forensic uh, experiences in in your graduate degree, or more of a, a broader base. Um, <laughs> I, I was lucky in that I, I got a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to work in a state hospital that had a forensic unit. Yeah. And so got some okay. exposure exposure there. I also um, chose the county jail as the site for one of my practicum placements. And I would go and do psychotherapy with uh, with inmates at the jail uh, uh -huh. to get to get some exposure to the population. And then uh, I went to the University of Virginia. And at the law school there, they had a forensic psychiatry clinic where I got the opportunity to observe uh, and occasionally participate in evaluations of real life criminals who had done mm -hmm. amazing things and uh, had the opportunity to learn that way as well. That's interesting. So it was also somewhat of a, um, a, a hybrid, not forensics 
specific program, but pro provided some experience that you were able to seek out or they were amenable to your tailoring the program to include those experiences. Correct. It's, it's all about uh, creating opportunities for yourself and pursuing your interest. Exactly. I, I, I would echo that in that UNC did not even have the strength or the, uh, of the, in, in terms of forensic uh, opportunities that, that UVA has. However, they were very open to the sort of choose your own adventure a, a approach or tailoring things. And I similarly was able to create a practicum at the, the Federal Medical Center in Butner um, at that time where the, the famed location of subsequently, I believe, of Bernie Madoff. <laughs> um, but, but anyhow, I just thought it would be useful to share some of those personal experiences. So for those of you who want to take the medical school trajectory or considering it, uh, here is an outline of the different educational pathway a psychiatrist and then more specifically forensic psychiatrist would, would take. So undergrad, obviously, can't, uh, can't avoid that. Um, though to pursue medical school, there obviously is a pre-med pre track that most medical schools require um, it's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into to, to all of that, but I'm sure each of our audience members are, are bright enough to either know about that already and or have, know how to look into that. Um, rather than the GRE, the MCAT is the entrance exam that one takes to attend medical school. Uh, within medical school, which lasts around four years, um, one rotates in the specialized experience they receive, but have a strong Sort of uh, biomedical um, background that's developed during that time, um, and obtain psychiatry or exposure to psychiatry. I must say, of my colleagues that I have polled um, who are forensic psychiatrists, I, I couldn't find one who, who knew as early as medical school that they wanted to be a forensic psychologist, psychiatrist, rather. Um, but along the way develop that interest. Um, however, a benefit that was noted of one uh, by one of my colleagues who's a forensic psychiatrist uh, was that you know, if, if one does know or uh, that, that they enjoy treating persons, um, you know, medical school and the degree that medical school affords and for, after further specialization, um, you know, to prescribe medications and, and have that extra uh, skill set um, within what you do is, you know, it can prove quite beneficial. And when we get to the salary page, I must state that um, there is still a, generally a discrepancy between what forensic psychologists versus psychiatrists make. Um, residency uh, in psychiatry uh, generally takes three to four years. And that's when individuals who take the psychiatric pathway actually specialize in mental health and psychiatric issues. Um, boards, psychiatric boards, uh, then are taken. And finally, the forensic specialization piece doesn't really occur until, until after residency. Though I'm sure, akin to what Dr. Martell was saying myself, one can um, be proactive and creative and figure out ways to tailor experience your experiences earlier on in the process. Um, and in terms of educational resources for the MDs, uh, looking into the American or the Association of the American Medical Colleges uh, website, they have a specific student section, which is useful and provides some um, pragmatic details about how one uh, or the experiences that one should pursue in approaching applying to medical school. Um, specifically, the American Psychiatric Association has a few websites um, or a few pages within their website uh, tailored to medical students and, and residents and provides an overview of the discipline of psychiatry more generally. And the American Academy of Forensic Psychiatry, which is um, the psychiatry, I think, equivalent, one could say, of the American Academy of Psychology and Law, um, and they offer information on the website uh, about various uh, forensic fellowships, which is that 
uh, last step in in the process. All right. So licensure and board certification, that's the next step once you've finished all of this educational training. Um, so who needs a license? I've, I've covered this essentially, but um, psychologists and psychiatrists who deliver a diagnostic um, or forensic assessment service on any given individual. So if you work with people and provide evaluation or treatment in the forensic context, you likely need a license. Um, both psychologists and psychiatrists are licensed by separate boards um, to practice their individual disciplines. Board certification is also um, they're able, <laughs> one is possible to pursue, it is possible to pursue board certification in both forensic psychology and forensic psychiatry. Um, I must state here uh, that Dr. Martel is one of the esteemed diplomats of the American Board of Forensic Psychology and has, has gone this, this route. I'm in the process of finishing all of the readings of one of the many steps <laughs> that one takes um, to pursue board certification right now. It's a lot of work, but it's well worth it because you, yes. you, you grow as a professional, you fill in gaps in your knowledge, and you become a better practitioner for having uh, stood the test of fire. And that it takes will, to get there. I will concur, albeit reluctantly, as I'm looking at a pile of books and articles that I am in the process <laughs> of getting through to, to take the written exam. So, um, but, but to let all of you know that, that, that once one completes their, their education, um, I guess their core education to become a forensic psychologist, it's still not over. But it's actually, I, 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 I joke about it, but it, I do find it actually sort of fun and rewarding in in the knowledge that I feel like I'm I'm gaining and doing it. So, and, and we should know. clarify that you don't have to become board certified. Uh, you can, particularly in psychology and in, in psychiatry, it's pretty much everybody does it, and everybody yeah. gets it. In psychology, fewer people do it. It's maybe harder to get, but it's also relatively rare. The majority of psychologists do not become board certified. And you don't have to have it uh, in order to practice. It just takes you to a better or a higher level uh, in terms of your skills. Yes. And in, in terms of the intellectual challenges, I think that one continues to face along, I guess, their, their, through their professional experiences. It just, it ends up, at least for me, has felt like something, well, you never really stop learning and there are never ending questions um, within this field to, to answer. So it just makes sense from my perspective to continue on in that trajectory, but there's a good clarification. That it's not necessary. Um, so as to not paint the picture that you really can never stop <laughs> in your education in becoming a forensic psychologist or psychiatrist. All right. So salaried employment options. Um, it's the, the reality of this all, well, in terms of salary, is somewhat hard to capture because I think there's just so much variation um, based on various factors, such as uh, the amount of training one has received, the area in which one is employed, the area of the country in which one is employed, um, whether in private practice or uh, work for a state or work in academia. Um, but in terms of sort of general rules <laughs> or trends um, that I've gleaned both through speaking with colleagues and uh, overview of, of resources um, on the, the internet, et cetera, uh, psychiatrists den t do still tend to out earn uh, their psychology colleagues in forensics. Um, Dr. Martel, please chime in if uh, you you have any information to the contrary or... Um, when, when, when I go out to speak to groups of uh, attorneys, I always ask them, what's the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist? And they fumble and fuss and talk about drugs and MDs and PhDs. And I say, no, the difference is $100 an hour. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> meaning, that's, meaning that's, that psychiatrists bill their time at a higher rate. Uh, higher rate by a hundred dollars. I don't know that it's entirely deserved, 
Um, <laughs> I'll concur based on my training as a psychologist yeah, as well. And, and we're biased being psychologists. Yes, but, exactly. But, but the truth of the matter is that we really do the same things in forensic work, unless there's a special exactly. issue of the effect of a medication on someone's behavior. 95% of the time, uh, that's not an issue, and both professions are dealing with the same questions of trial competency or insanity, uh, and uh, the initials after your name make little difference. Absolutely, and I think like you said, there are some specific or specialized areas in which I can, for example, in the past few weeks have consulted with a psychiatrist friend relative to a question about withdrawal effects of a certain very specific drug and his expertise in addiction medicine. Um, but he's also consulted with me based on my expertise within the area of psychological assessment. So um, it, there's a nice, perhaps, uh, balance or um, yeah, we we complement, I guess, each other in some of our special specialized uh, knowledge. Um, but in general, I'd, I'd also add for us. I'd also add for this slide. You know, the the salary range you have listed for uh, for psychologists is an entry level. So once you get through yeah, all your true. schooling, that's kind of where you start, and it can go up significantly from there. A absolutely, a quite. Yes. And uh, similarly for the psychiatrist, I think this was an entry level uh, number that I found. Um, I guess a point to note is that within psychology, um, well, I guess psychiatry isn't even an option, but receiving a, bastor, uh, a, bastor, <laughs> a bachelor's or a master's level um, does not, well, um, it, it certainly does not allow the same earning potential. Uh, but moreover, individuals who hold those, those titles uh, or that level of training um, may function as a psychological assistant or associate. But in some states, um, individuals, I believe, even with a master's level cannot complete certain court-ordered evaluations um, that those with a doctoral level or an MD level can complete. Um, I know that's the case in Georgia, at least with competency of competency to stand trial evaluations. That, that's um, the truth. That's the truth most everywhere. That if you want to be the person that goes into court, goes into the jail, does the evaluation, and comes to court and testifies, you've got to get a terminal degree, a PhD or an MD. Yes. Um, yes. Below that, you're going to be working in different settings, and you're probably not going to be the person uh, going to court and offering opinions. Absolutely. And um, I have to state this, private practitioners do tend to out-earn academics. Um, I think that's probably true of the cross discipline, but it's not to say that you can't do all of the above if you, if you want to. Um, and this actually is, is not quite accurate because typical hourly rates um, can actually go much higher than this, um, depending on what area of the country you are and, and, and depending on training. This was a uh, estimate that was provided through, I think, APLS um, for psychologists, but it does vary considerably. Um, I can provide this slide to any of our audience members who are still around and um, interested in this level of detail. This is essentially listing some pros and cons and example employers of individuals who work in the private versus public versus academic sector. Um, but I want to make sure that we have some time for, for questions, um, at, at the end. So I may breeze through this, uh, at present, um, though I will just specifically highlight some general downsides and benefits that myself and colleagues, um, folks within the field have, have listed, um, as related to this field. Uh, so in terms of, of, of downsides, um, and these are all, you know, so general and contingent upon personality characteristics and, and all sorts of things, but I'll list them nonetheless. Um, you know, obviously, based on what we've discussed thus far, there's a significant educational 
commitment. Though this was listed as a downside, I also should state if one enjoys education, that may not be a downside at all. <laughs> um, I personally really enjoyed graduate school. Uh, so something to consider though. Um, pay can also be low relative to the amount of education and work required. It all really just depends on so many factors, um, such as what area of the country you are, your level of training, if you're in private practice, et cetera. Um, frustration, stress, and burnout can occur, certainly, um, and specifically within the context of forensics, given the adversarial and high level of scrutiny that is really just intrinsic to being in, involved um, or associated with the legal process, perhaps. Um, and the number of work hours that, that one could put into to being in this profession. Uh, there are cases that one may wish uh, you could help someone more than you can, um, but it's just not your role. Um, and this is specifically, I mentioned this specifically in that one may be hired as a forensic evaluator on, for example, in a criminal case. And the individual could be facing, um, well, let's say the death penalty. And perhaps you, if it was your decision, uh, you don't necessarily think they, they should get that. Um, however, that's not your job in, in the case. Your job is to help inform the court, um, perhaps depending on how you're hired, uh, let's say factors uh, to help inform the court or educate the court on factors uh, that may suggest that this person should not receive the death penalty. Um, at the end of the day, you may do all you can, but the outcome may be other than what you would wish. Um, it can be an emotionally grueling uh, task to, to contend with with those types of situations in which the outcome of the case is other than what you perhaps morally or ethically um, or just personally would have liked to have happened. Um, so it's, it's something to consider. Um, in terms of benefits, there are opportunities, however, um, to help others, though one's definition of help um, may have to become somewhat fluid uh, depending on what role one is in in your job. Um, there, are, there are diverse <laughs> career paths, which hopefully you've gleaned through this presentation thus far, uh, which I think makes it quite exciting and certainly leads to a tremendous amount of variety in one's daily or weekly or monthly life. Um, one could work in criminal courts, one could consult, one could consult with the government, one could work for the state, one could concurrently be doing research um, and teach. Uh, so it's quite exciting. Um, it can be a challenging and rewarding career both. Um, and it's certainly, well, from my perspective, never boring. Um, oh, and I couldn't help myself here. I, I suppose another downside, um, and this is just because I enjoy this image, and it specifically comes out of L.A. County Jail, which is where I did um, a rotation in my forensic fellowship. But... Uh, if one works in a criminal context, uh, and specifically in a criminal context at uh, LA County Jail or most jails or prisons, um, a downside may be you're working with a spitter, someone who may gas you or provide a flooding risk. Um, these are signs that actually are on the, the, the deputies at LA County Jail put on the cell doors. Um, this will go back a slide. And for those of you who don't know what these things are, spitting is self-explanatory. Those are for individuals, inmates who tend to spit. Gassing is more colorful. That's slang for persons who enjoy throwing um, feces or other bodily fluids at others. And flooding uh, relates to the lovely tendency of individuals to stuff things in their toilet and press the flush button, which um, causes an interesting effect. So I guess that's a downside. Uh, adds for a colorful work environment, which could also be a benefit. Um, and I suppose I'll just end with more personally what I enjoy about my own job. And Dr. Martel, please 
also uh, chime in if you'd, you'd like. Um, you know, for, for me, being a forensic psychologist, it's a good personal fit with my personality, um, interests, strengths, and preferences. And I suppose I say this perhaps as a psychologist, you know, to model that considering aspects such as your personality and interests and strengths and preferences is quite important in determining whatever career trajectory you choose. Um, I'll just share, I think I have a fairly thick skin. I can handle things that are perhaps other fine gross um, or emotionally difficult. Uh, I enjoy the intellectual challenges of working on uh, complex legal, ethical, and clinical puzzles. I really have always loved writing and certainly do a lot of it in this field. Um, translating psychological findings for a lay or legal audience is always an interesting task. You know, if you get so together with other psychologists or psychiatrists, you might all speak in kind of psychobabble, but that ain't going to fly in the court. Um, you may be having to explain complex psychological concepts to a lay audience or often do that. Um, I like the process of testimony. I used to, um, a Lincoln Douglas debate nerd and like the sparring, um, aspect of that, which is also intrinsic to their, if it's their real process. So knowing that one might not cower in that environment might be important to consider in, in choosing this trajectory. Um, I've also, also, I, I also enjoy attempting to non-judgmentally understand groups that society tends to ignore or fear, which specifically relates to working often with a criminal or indigent or underserved population. Um, so there is a bit of self-disclosure <laughs> uh, in terms of my own interests in, in the field. And uh, I've also, will end with, uh, and, and can, will happily send to anybody who's uh, listening, um, a list of, of resources um, that one may use to, to help learn more about forensic psychology or psychiatry. And with that, I say thank you in a prison tattoo <laughs> format. <laughs> That's awesome, Lauren. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Or I should say, Dr. Reba Harrison. Oh, right. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Martel. Um, so, we're a very formal crowd. Now, shall I? I'm, I'm, a, I'm attempting to navigate um, the technical uh, aspect of all of this. Well, I'm, I'm going to put my screensaver back on because I think we're now in discussion mode. Is that right? Or you've been answering questions throughout? I, I have been answering questions. We've been going for about an hour and 10 minutes. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to stay for a few minutes. I'm not quite sure uh, the best way to do this. If people want to type questions, I can read them and then Lauren and I can discuss them. Um, that's probably the easiest way. So if you have a question, go ahead and type it. So here's the first one. Could you encounter a criminal you're assessing that threatens you if you don't evaluate them, quote, correctly? Close quote. Could you assess? I'm sorry. I'm in the process of apparently I'm. Sure. Well, I'll, 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 take, I'll take the question. It's an interesting question. Um, you know, how risky a job is this? And yeah. I can say I, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of criminals and no one has ever laid a finger on me. Uh, I did have one man who swept all of my test equipment onto the floor, but he never touched me. Um, so I think a lot of it has to do with your own personal style and the amount of respect that you show people. Uh, there was a saying when I worked in a maximum security hospital that just because they're murderers doesn't mean they're not nice guys. <laughs> I and, like that. I like and you kind of have to keep that in mind. They're still people. And if you treat them with respect, you'll get respect back. And uh, generally, you, you won't get hurt. The cases in which I know of psych forensic psychiatrists and psychologists being assaulted uh, generally arise from situations where uh, either they were disrespectful to the person uh, or the person was so acutely disturbed that they had no business being in the room with them uh, without help. That's a very good Good point. I similarly have never been assaulted in in my work. 
Um, and if I work predominantly with uh, individuals who are severely mentally ill and uh, in a criminal context who have, specifically in my state job, who have historically um, murdered or raped individuals. Um, I, yeah, I really, I, I simply echo your your statement about the respect piece as well as a level of, of cautiousness um, generally in approaching others. Um, so I can say that verbally I've, and I, I don't want to specifically say it's just uh, endemic to being a, a, a female um, working often in a jail or hospital setting. Um, with predominantly male criminal population, um, I, I have encountered you know, annoying uh, and or gross uh, ver verbal <laughs> or um, sexualized observation of sexualized activities, uh, but I've never felt in danger. It just comes with the job. Any other questions out there? Here comes one. I'm a, I'm a second year crim psych major with a minor in forensics. I'm not I getting am, these questions. Are you getting these? Um, they're, they're, popping, they're, they're, they're popping, popping up for up me. For you. If you, okay. if you, if you drop down, oh, that one vanished. Oh, now you, I got it. Okay. Oh. Oops. But I, I think they withdrew now their what, question. You don't have it? Oh no. I don't, no, I don't have the new question. Yeah. Oh no, so, but now I think I have it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll read, I'll read this one then since I'm sure. seeing it on my screen. Okay. I'm a second year crim psych major uh, with a minor in forensics. I am not in a pre-medicine course, nor have I taken many med related courses. I am unable to pursue, am I unable to pursue psychiatry and can only go after psychology now? <laughs> Well, you know, you have to have a pre-medical curriculum uh, in order to apply for medical school. So if you don't have the coursework that's required for that, you may have to spend an extra semester or an extra year or whatever amount of time it takes to get that coursework under your belt. And, uh, and then you would qualify to take the MCAT and apply to medical school. Yes, uh, that makes sense to me as well. Um, okay. I I have a new question here. Oh. Are, are forensic psych internships similar, similar to general forensics internships, such as crime scene investigations? And I'll start on that by saying no. Uh, <laughs> crime scene investigation and, and general forensics are things that uh, police officers and detectives do. Um, I think TV fictionalizes what forensic psychologists do and that's generally not it if what you're interested in is crime scene investigation then you want to pursue a different career path than forensic psychology by and by and large uh, our internships have to do with understanding criminal populations or other legally relevant populations and specialized assessments that are going to help inform the court uh, about those populations. I'll simply concur and, and agree with your statement. I, I, I think that this issue of uh, criminal psychologists, or sorry, forensic psychologists or psychiatrists being involved in the crime scene investigation or the criminal investigation phase of a legal case is really mostly stuff of, of fiction um, or stuff of FBI profilers or perhaps consultants who occasionally work with police departments or other criminal investigators, but it's, it's really a rare phenomenon. Dr. Martel, have you consulted ever in that criminal investigation phase of an a legal investigation before? Uh, only rarely. Okay. Um, uh, more often, you know, it, it's an issue of trying to put together understanding the behavior of the criminal before, during, and after the commission of the crime in order to gain insight into their mental state 
and whether they were able to tell the difference between right and wrong, uh, which is the test for insanity in most states. Um, so it's, it's, it's not unheard of, but it's rare that psychologists would be called in during the investigation phase. Uh, right. The way that happens, um, in most of the country, uh, police officers apply to the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, and go there for special training in becoming a criminal profiler. And there are psychologists and psychiatrists that consult to that program. My colleague, uh, Dr. Park Dietz, a forensic psychiatrist, uh, was one of the founding fathers yes. of that whole approach. Um, but those kind of opportunities to train the police officers that go out and do the profiling, there are very few opportunities to do that kind of thing. Um, so if you want to be a profiler, become a police officer and yes. get a, be a psych major, become a police officer, and then go to Quantico and get the training. Yes, and become an FBI agent or a special agent. But, but that, it seems correct. that most profilers are agents or special agents if they're working in that government context or with the FBI. Um, and, 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 and many police departments in major metropolitan areas have, mm -hmm. uh, have units that where maybe one person will get that training or maybe a small group will get that training. Yes. Though I'll have to add, though, I know this is digressing from the specific point relative to the nature of our internships, but um, what you stated in, in, in the activities that are involved in answering questions such as that of what one's mental state is at the time of the offense, you know, we do as criminal or rather forensic psychologists or psychiatrists um, often spend a, a large amount of time you know, re reviewing investigatory uh, information or, or files, you know, Absolutely. to help us better understand what individuals were thinking or doing at, at the time of an instant offense. Um, just recently, I, I watched a few interrogation uh, videos of a defendant who was uh, recently charged with, with murder. And, you know, while not involved in that actual stage of the interrogation, the, the utility of, of reviewing that information um, is significant, you know, in, right. in my reaching my opinion. And, and so there is this, I guess I wanted to state that only in that there is an intersection in clear um, you know, import and involvement in looking back to that stage of an investigation and what we do. It, it, it's just we're not as actively involved in that actual investigative state stage. Uh, absolutely. I've visited crime scenes. I've yes. looked at autopsy photographs. I've attended autopsies uh, yes. in the past. So Me you too. can, you can get up to your elbows in it uh, if you <laughs> want and need to. We yes. have what we have one more question and then perhaps we're going to wrap up uh, the last question here. Okay. Should one take AP psychology and sociology classes in high school, or is it better to wait until college? My advice would be go for it. Take it in high school, because that's going to set you apart when it comes time to apply for college, and, uh, and will show a commitment to the field that began early in your, in your education. Absolutely. Quite, quite honestly, the fact that an AP, I mean, maybe this only speaks to my lack of experience in high school, but I don't believe AP psychology was even offered where I, or when I was in high school. So that sounds very cool. And um, I, from my perspective, would, would set somebody apart. Yeah. So I'd say, yes, go for it. Yeah, go for it. Why not? I'll give a chance for any more questions, and then I think we need to wrap this up. I think so. Is it just to clarify? I, I'm wanting to make sure. Does this end at? Perhaps we should ask our administrator here. Does this end at eight? Uh, or eight thirty. So nine? it would be nine Eastern. Uh, oh. Is when the final cutoff time is uh, that we've extended the webinar to. But uh, any time here okay. on out is. Uh, an okay time to wrap up if you guys have to go. We only uh, dedicated an hour originally to it. Okay. Okay, great. So I've got a question here. Are there major are there major differences between having a PsyD versus a PhD, such as pay or years in school 
or jobs more likely to hire one over the other? It's an interesting question. Um, I'll tell you this, you know, historically, there was only a PhD, and there are still some quarters in which that degree gets a little more respect than a PsyD. That being said, uh, the PsyD has gained in stature. It is all you need to qualify for licensure. It's all you need to become board certified in forensic psychology. Um, so there's nothing really wrong with it. I do not see it as hampering uh, your opportunities. Um, it may take somewhat less time out of your life uh, to get a PsyD because it doesn't have the emphasis on research that a PhD does. So it may not take as long to complete a dissertation. Uh, you may be able to get through school more quickly. So in some ways, it's a shortcut. Um, on the other hand, holding a PhD myself, I think it's a superior degree mm -hmm. that prepares you better to think about the problems uh, you'll be confronting and to contribute to our knowledge base uh, in forensic psychology. So it really depends on where your heart lies. If it's more in uh, doing science and moving the field forward or more in uh, going to court and evaluating criminals, uh, you, can do, you can do the latter with either a PsyD or a PhD, but you won't really be prepared to contribute to knowledge uh, without a PhD. Mm -hmm. I, again, I, I will first acknowledge bias as well, um, you know, given that I also went the PhD trajectory and also at a school that was very research focused. And I'm con I, I know both Dr. Martel and, and myself are still involved in contributing to um, the literature in, in various ways. And, and I think, um, the ability to dissect, I think, research and research methodology that perhaps gets a little bit more attention in a PhD program, I, I have found valuable in my forensic work, even when not doing research, only because I can, I believe it helped prepare me to, in, in looking at various studies, uh, say, well, this study itself is somewhat flawed and this study itself, you know, whereas this other study is somewhat more valuable and contributing to the broader literature. And then in testifying, should one be asked on the stand about say literature related to developmental immaturity and diminished capacity in relationship to a certain crime? Um, one perhaps feels more prepared to analyze, dissect, and then answer such questions. Um, it's, but, but then again, it's, it's not absolutely necessary. And I wholeheartedly acknowledge the bias that I bring to the table in regard to uh, responding to this question. Um, well, I've, I've got a new question here that I think Dr. Reba Harrelson is well equipped to address, and that is, what is the role and duties of a forensic psych, either MD or PhD, at a medical examiner's office or a coroner's office? Ooh, interesting question. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with an editorial comment, which is, I wish it was greater than it, it actually is in reality. Um, and, and I'll also provide an anecdote. I, well, I'll answer the question, I suppose, first. Um, I, I don't think that most, rather, I'm fairly sure that most medical examiner or coroner's offices do not employ a psychologist, certainly in a full-time role, let alone even in a consultant role, um, certainly in a, not in an employed capacity. Um, and I still think it's relatively rare that coroners or medical examiners rely upon or consult with forensic psychologists or psychiatrists in determining mode of death. Um, there are just, I can, can state this, I know that the University of Southern California has had a close relationship with the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office. And I know the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office has a long history of using psychological autopsies as a means to help elucidate uh, the mode of death in matters in which 
it's undetermined or there's a question of whether it's a suicide or accident and the issue has been disputed or the finding that the coroner has made or the medical examiner has made has been disputed by a family member. Um, that's a gigantic uh, office, the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office. Um, and I, my knowledge, to my knowledge, it's relatively rare um, in its employment or use of the consultant consultation of forensic psychologists or psychiatrists. Um, I recently spoke with uh, some other individuals who are members of the pathology section of AAFS about the use of, of psychologists in the process of doing psychological autopsies. It sounds like the consensus is from their discipline that it, it, it doesn't happen all that often. Um, there's a very long-winded response. <laughs> but, a, but an accurate one. Yes. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I think that um, actually Dr. Downs, who's at the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, Jamie Downs, who's um, a prominent member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences and a, a, a pathologist, um, also recently shared his perspective on on that and perhaps why it's uh, not a role that forensic psychologists or psychiatrists play as often um, with me. And from his perspective, uh, it, it appears that there just aren't that many cases in which the issue arises, um, in which questioning whether this is a suicide versus specifically an accident um, is equivocal or is, is questioned. Um, and so that, that there's one, I guess, one perspective that I'm, uh, sort of summarizing regarding why that's the case. Um, money would be another reason I would guess. Very good. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm seeing no new questions. So no if you have questions. a question, if you have a question, now's the time to ask it. Otherwise we'll uh, wrap up here. Give them a minute to type. Great. Uh, oh, I got one more here for you guys. Sorry about that. Okay. It should have come off to you, Daniel. Uh, the I, question don't, I don't have it. Well, the question is, if I go into a forensic program that provides me a master's and I think they meant bachelor's in forensics and work on a psychology minor. Would you still recommend I go to get a master's or a PhD in psychology in order to enter into the field? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. You're, you're not going to really find any employment with just a bachelor's degree uh, and a psych major. You're going to need to have at least a master's degree in order to find work in yes. this field. Okay. I also can well, it looks like uh, things are wrapping up here. Uh, we just want to thank the audience for coming in and joining us and being so active today. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ruba Harrison and Dr. Martel. Uh, Welcome. Pleasure having thank you guys. Um, feel free to join us uh, for any of our future webinars. Check them out at aafs.org slash webinars. And we will have some uh, links posted there to access this if you have someone else that you think this could be beneficial for them to see. Um, other than that, thank you very much. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. We appreciate your participation. Bye-bye. Bye now.